to talk about eosinophilic lung disease today. Um, this is a pretty big topic. Um, I think each of these diseases that falls under this category could be its own lecture. Um, I did pick a couple of different disease processes to talk about, some of which we don't see as often, um, other ones we're a little bit more familiar with, um, and I just thought it would be interesting to review a couple of them. Um, so don't have any disclosures. Um, okay, so the outline for the presentation is basically going to be we're going to start with an introduction um, into what is the you know the basics of what is a, what are eosinophils, what kind of their inflammatory process look like that they're involved in, and then um, I'm going to get into the actual disease processes. So um, I chose to talk about the hyper eosinophilic syndromes, ABPA, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis some drug-induced eosinophilia causes an aspirin-exacerbated respiratory disease. Now there's, of course, many other uh, processes that can lead to pulmonary eosinophilia, such as acute and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, parasitic infections, eosinophilic bronchitis. I feel like we've touched on those quite a bit um, over the past year, so I just wanted to choose some other diff some different ones that we may not have discussed as much. So, what is pulmonary eosinophilia? So it's described as there's an elevate, elevation of the per, peripheral eosinophils, usually more than 500, with abnormal lung imaging. Um, there's also, if, in patients, many of these patients um, undergo bronchoscopy with BAL, um, and normally you'll see eosinophils elevated and the uh, BAL results greater than 10%. And in patients who undergo tissue biopsies, you'll see uh, tissue eosinophilia as well. This picture here, of course, is a peripheral blood smear. The arrow there is pointing to, um, you know, an eosinophil just to show you kind of what its structure looks like. Now, the 10% that I'm talking about here, um, that's not necessarily like what you're gonna, you know, you may see numbers much higher than that. Um, different uh, disease processes, you know, on average, you can see, if, you know, on t uh, the percentage of 20 to 25%, but obviously you can go much higher than that depending on the severity. Um, in terms of the abnormal lung imaging, a lot of these patients, are, of course, are going to present with uh, uh, respiratory symptoms. So many will undergo radiographic uh, radiographs and CT scans, and we'll kind of go through what those abnormalities look like as we go through each disease process. So, in terms of the pathophysiology, um, eosinophils are um, derived from hematopoietic stem cells. Kind of going back to our first day review days. Um, there are, uh, they are uh, undergo maturation and activation predominantly by IL-5. There are, there's a many, many different, you know, cytokines, mediators involved, but IL-5 seems to be the, one of the uh, main uh, mediators involved. Other ones include IL-3 and gra granulocyte macrophage colony, colony stimulating factor. And the IL-5 basically is in charge of the expansion of eosinophils, causes them to be released from the bone marrow, um, the other thing that's pretty common in eosinophilic uh, cells are the granules. These contain, contain uh, specific proteins involved in their defense mechanisms. 
They're also the main cells involved in allergic inflammation. And of course, they act as the host of the uh, defense and the release of those proteins from the granules, granules are what aids it in doing that. Now, of course, in the process, in these, in these disease processes, um, you know, ex a lot of uh, extensive, you know, release of these proteins can be cytotoxic to the body's own cells. Um, when the eosinophils have matured, they normally hang, uh, uh, reside in the uh, tissues of the body, and then they'll be released into the bloodstream to go to their target organ when needed. I thought this was a good um, kind of structure of the eosinophil, just to point out some um, uh, important parts. Um, the granules, like I said, are you know probably the most important component to these. Um, they are basically store different um, protein substances. So the primary granules are smaller. Uh, they contain the proteins that um, you know that produce the charcoal laden uh, crystals and proteins that you see. Secondary granules are larger. They contain the basic proteins, cytokines, uh, chemokines, and growth factors. Um, the other thing that we see is um, the lipid bodies here. Um, I thought this was an interesting point. So the lipid bodies are found in the cytoplasm, and they provide a substrate to develop econosoids, which are involved in the pathways of inflammation. So they see, they've seen on um, tissue biopsies um, or, you know, under uh, examination of the cells that these lipid bodies are quite large in areas where there's a lot of inflammation involving the eosinophils. The nucleus of the eosinophil is, um, is segmented. Usually you see it as bilobed. Um, that's kind of a unique characteristic of that as well. Um, so they're abundant in immune reactions mediated by IgE and parasitic infections. The major basic protein released by the granules is toxic to parasites. Um, and kind of like I said before, the inflammatory release can be injurious to the host tissues as, as well um, in many different conditions. Um, eosinophils, of course, are involved in many different uh, uh, disease mechanisms, asthma, uh, PCP, lymphoma, rheumatoid disease, there's many more. Um, this is a pathology slide basically showing um, eosinophils involved in the tissue, so the arrows are pointing to those structures there. So now that we kind of have a foundation of, um, you know, what we're dealing with here, I'm going to go, in, go into the actual disease processes. So like I said before, the differential is, you know, it's quite extensive. Um, this is kind of a, a nice list showing the various of various disease processes that can be caused by, uh, can cause pulmonary eosinophilia. The first disease that I'm going to start with is hyper, e hyper eosinophilic syndrome. So this was a topic that I wasn't very familiar with. Um, that's why I kind of chose it. I think it's good to review. Um, a lot of these conditions are managed by hematologists at the point of, you know, diagnosis and treatment. Um, but we may see a lot of these patients as the first, as the first line, because they could, they may come to us with pulmonary symptoms, you know, the eosinophilia. So I think it's important for us to be able to screen them and recognize it. Um, they're fairly rare. Um, there's basically an elevated eosinophil account for at least six months. Tissue pathology shows. Um, large amount of eosinophils in the bone marrow, greater than 20%, um, extensive tissue infiltration, and then of course you'll see deposition of the granule proteins and tissue, and then there'll be end, uh, end organ damage from all this inflammation. Now the pathology or the pathophysiology um, is very, it's, it's very complex. It's not completely understood yet, but the, you know, the, the general over, overarching theme is there's a dysregulation. So either there's uncontrolled proliferation, overproduction of cytokines, and that can cause, um, you know, a clonal expansion of the eosinophils. Um, they're, they're um, you know, the mediators that I talked about before, IL-3, IL-5, and the colony stimulating factor, those all can be involved as well. Um, and basically their uncontrolled regulation causes overproduction of them. So there's a few variants. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple of them. The first is the myeloproliferative. There's a T lymphocytic variant, familial, and idiopathic. The myeloproliferative, as the name suggests, exhi exhibits features similar to those of the myeloproliferative disorder. So there's increased B12 levels on labs, chromosomal abnormalities, which I'll get to in another slide, anemia, thrombocytopenia, hepatosplenomegaly. Um, 
in terms of um, kind of a genetic um, cause. So there's, a, there's many different mutations that have been studied. Um, in the articles that I was reading, one of the most common ones that they had talked about was this interstitial deletion on chromosome 4. It creates this fusion protein here that alters the uh, tyrosine kinase activity of these cells. And what this leads us to is a clonal expansion. There's many other mutations. There's another very common one is a rearrangement of the genes coding for a fibroblast growth factor. And these together you know, will contribute to that. The lymphocytic variant, so this predominantly affects skin and soft tissues, but of course it can affect you know, any organ in the body. Um, this is dealing with abnormal T cells producing excess uh, growth factors and mediators. It is associated with progression to lymphoma. You can see an increased serum IgE and polyclonal hyperglobulinemia. Idiopathic is very common. Um, a lot of the articles that I was reading regarding this, you know, was stating that this is, you know, one of the most predominant types. It shares features of the previous two, um, but the underlying cause, you know, is, is not identified in these in these patients. But there's still multi-organ involvement um, for this. So in terms of the organ damage, of course, depending on what organ is damaged, that kind of determines the prognosis or core factor. So of course, if like the heart or the lungs are affected, that is a poor prognosis. So I think, you know, the way that I kind of, kind of remember this is you're going to get an infiltration of eosinophils in these various organ systems. It's going to cause inflammation, fibrosis, and a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, pathology that you see is based on that disease process. So for example, in the heart, um, you can get myocarditis, fibrosis, which then can lead to a restrictive cardiomyopathy. Um, pulmonary wide, you can get, fib again, fibrosis, um, you can get pulmonary emboli, pulmonary edema, especially in those patients with underlying heart, dis heart failure from the cardiac uh, disease. Um, CT or imaging can show ground glass opacities and nodules. Neurologically, um, they st often see peripheral neuropathy, cerebral emboli, encephalopathy, and then cutaneous um, symptoms include conditions like eczema, skin thickening, leukodermal. And another thing to look out for in these patients is if the fibrosis infiltrating the fibrosis in the heart affects any kind of the valves, you can get valvular disorders as well. Um, these patients often, in terms of the pulmonary manifestations, will present with dyspnea, cough, and wheezing. And the chest, uh, chest CTs often show ground class opacities or nodules. So I was able to find a couple of uh, radiology resources. If any of you want them, I thought they were very helpful. It kind of walks you through the various eosinophilic lung diseases and radiographic findings and common uh, findings that you'll see. So um, pulmonary involvement is seen in 40% of the ca in these cases. Um, and like I kind of said before, the, you can see um, things like pulmonary edema, nodular opacities, ground glass opacities, and um, pleural effusions. Um, this cut was a 59-year-old woman with uh, hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Um, there's a couple of things that are being pointed to in here. So the small arrowheads are showing bronchial thickening. The long arrows are showing inter interlobular septal thickening. And the curved arrow arrows are showing um, nodules. These are a couple more patients. These are two patients with idiopathic HES. Um, the one on the left in the chest x-ray is a 12-year-old child who pre presented with cough, shortness of breath, and peripheral eosinophilia. Um, this chest x-ray, as you can see here, is showing bi you know, bilateral airspace opacity throughout the lungs um, and nodular uh, opacities. Um, I included a pathology slide on the right. Um, this is basically sh showing a three-month-year-old with idiopathic HES, and this is showing some eosinophilic infiltration um, in the lungs of the right lower lobe lung biopsy. So in terms of the treatment, again, at this point, they're likely going to be managed by hematologists. So I think it's just in, important to kind of get the basics and some you know highlights from here. Uh, there's, of course, no cure for this. And the treatment goals include immunosuppression to try and reduce end organ damage occurring and the amount of eosinophils. And the indications for treatment, of course, depend on the severity and what organs are involved. Symptomatic patients with end organ damage, of course, should be treated. Um, 
steroids are the first line treatment and a lot of patients will undergo steroids. This will kind of uh, cause an immediate suppression of the eosinophils. Um, and these are usually the first line in patients who do not have those tyrosine kinase mutations I talked about in a previous slide. Um, uh, if the patients are still not able to get, uh, if they're refractory to the steroid treatment, you can also use the cytotoxic agents that are listed here. Um, for the myeloid variant with the fusion gene we talked about, uh, imatinib is actually one of the first line medications because that's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And that makes sense because that's the kind of tyrosine kinase is what's affected in that mutation. Okay. So the next one, uh, ABPA. So this one I think we're a little bit more familiar with. Um, this one is hyper, uh, hypersensitivity reaction, uh, basically brought upon by antigens from aspergillus. And the issue with this disease is that there's colonization of the airway of aspergillus, um, most commonly 90% of the fumigatus um, uh, species. Um, but these patients, these, this disease occurs in patients who have underlying lung disease. So mainly as, asthma, cystic fibrosis, less commonly can be seen in people with underlying bronchiectasis, chronic, chronic uh, granulomatous disease. Um, so moving on to the next slide here. Uh, just a few points about the cuspidrillus in general. It's a spore-forming fungus and survive in cool to hot environments, um, 15, to 50, 15 to 53 degrees Celsius. You have uh, their branching at 45 degree angles. Um, obtains its nutrition from decaying matter, soil, water, compost. Um, can also be found in damp areas. Uh, you may hear of you know patients who have floods in their basement and they have fungal growth. I actually just had a patient that I saw in clinic three weeks ago who had flooding in their kitchen and there was five species of aspergillus um, in the ground and in the air that when they had the testing done. Uh, spores are easily mobile by wind or physical contact. Um, and the basically this, the patients can range from, range from being uh, completely asymptomatic, aspergillomas, if they have underlying you know, cavitary disease, ABPA, chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, and then invasive aspergillosis, mainly seen in those who are immunosuppressed. So colonization versus infection. Um, humans are exposed to these spores pretty frequently, and you know colonization is not uncommon. Um, but our immune system usually works to clear away the spores, preventing any kind of infection or any kind of localized inflammation. And kind of like I mentioned before, um, the risk of invasive disease um, infection depends on the immune status of the patient and underlying lung disease. So in terms of the pathophysiology, there's thought to be an exaggerated immune response to the aspergillus antigens. Um, colonization causes constant exposure to the antigens. Obstructive airway disease, impairment in ciliary clearance can contribute as well. And there's various pathways that may contribute to inflammation, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide. So kind of a local response, um, there's various products produced by the fungus itself um, that it causes local inflammation at the levels of the tissue. So this is like collagenase, elastase, trypsin. And there's also hypersensitivity immune responses, mainly a type 1 and type 3, type 1 being a cell bound IgE causing mast cell and eosinophil degranulation. And type 3 is mediated by IgG and complement activity, activation. Um, and then with all this inflammation, depending on its stage, it can lead to bronchial wall thickening, airway remodeling, bronchiectasis, and um, even fibrosis. I thought this was a pretty useful um, uh, picture here, just kind of putting the different immune, uh, immune responses together. So you can see the local, uh, local inflammation at the top. This is like the spores themselves and the um, fungus releasing those, um, uh, releasing those toxins causing airway damage. On the left, you have the type one immune response, which is the IgE mediated, um, causing the uh, degranulation of the eosinophils and mast cells. Uh, type 3 on the right side, the IgG mediated and complement activation. And at the bottom, also it, the T cells and B cells specific to the aspergillus can produce antibodies, which can um, make, you know, make inflammation worse. So clinical features, a lot of these patients can present with wheezing, coughing, fatigue, fevers, chest pain, sputum tends to be copious, may contain brown plugs, um, which is from fungal debris. Laboratory results can show eosinophilia, elevated IgE, IgG antibodies to aspergillus. Um, the mucus plugs, if you look at it under, you know, uh, under pathology, can um, 
contain eosinophils, charcoal-laden crystals, and the sputum culture may grow uh, aspergillus as well. In terms of imaging, um, the ch chest, for, on the chest radiograph, um, opacities are usually seen in the upper and central zones of the lungs. Atelectasis is common due to the mucus infection, and there can be findings suggestive of bronchiectasis. On the chest CT, <clears throat> central bronchiectasis, if the disease has progressed that far, um, can be seen uh, with an upper bowl predominance, rocking wall thickening, nodules, tree and opacities, and peripheral consolidation. A lot of the opacities that you'll see, and I'm going to show on the next slide, um, um, can be from the mucus impaction because that's a big part of the disease process. So a couple more images that I found. Um, on the left side, this was a 31-year-old asthmatic male um, with a 15% peripheral eosinophilia. Um, the chest x-ray here is showing some tubular cystic changes. Um, there's some consolidation uh, pointed by the arrows, uh, which is likely mucus plugging. And one of the radiographic signs that I was reading about that you often see is something called the gloved finger. On the CT chest on the right side, um, uh, we're seeing central bronchiectasis, and then the arrows are pointing to areas of mucus plugging, which obviously is showing us as consolidation. In terms of the diagnosis, so I think this is a really helpful chart. I often use this, um, you know, keep this close by in clinic when I'm seeing patients. Um, it's brought, it's derived from the International Society for Human and Animal Mycology. So um, it kind of goes through what you should be looking for and what should be, you know, what is required for you to proceed with a diagnosis of ABPA. So predisposing conditions should be involved. We talked about asthma and cystic fibrosis as the main ones. Um, there should be serum IgG, IgE levels against aspergillus. Um, I believe this is the inhalant uh, panel that we order in clinic, um, or there's aspergillus skin test positivity. Um, and they also will need elevated total Ig concentrations, um, typically greater than 1,000. Other criteria, at least two of these have to be present, is uh, precipitating serum antibodies to aspergillus or elevated aspergillus IgG, um, radiographic pulmonary opacities, and then a total eosinophilic count greater than 500 in glucocorticoid naive patient. That's an important uh, thing to note because if someone's on steroid, steroids, their eosinophilic, eosinophilic count could be suppressed. A lot of the articles that I was reading to review this um, did have, you know, did make some mention on cystic fibrosis because patients if, who have maybe more advanced ABPA, um, a lot, there can be a lot of similarities in radiographic findings between the two diseases. So sometimes it can be hard to distinguish, is this a CF exacerbation or is this ABPA? Uh, so I, the, a lot of, a lot of the, the consensus that I was seeing is you should suspect it, of course, in patients who do not respond to antibiotics uh, during a CF exacerbation. So if you're treating them for about a week, they're still doing, a, doing the same, um, you should start looking for other diagnoses. Um, I was reviewing the cystic fibrosis clinical care guidelines, which I thought was useful. And this is kind of some guidelines to keep in, uh, keep in mind for patients with CF and when you should screen them. So they actually had recommended checking a serum IgE annually. If greater than 500, then you should proceed with cutaneous testing or serum IgE testing. Um, you should have a high level of suspicion of ABPA in patients greater than six years old. Uh, if the total IgE is 200 to 500, repeat the test if there's a high suspicion and continue diagnostic workup. So in terms of treatment, the goal here is to, is to prevent irreversible fibrosis um, and you know, obviously get the patient symptomatically feeling better and the inflammation reduced. So there are five stages of ABPA. There's the acute disease phase, remission, exacerbation, steroid dependent, of course, so you're not able to wean them off steroids, and then the end stage, which is fibrosis, bronchiectasis, and can even lead to pulmonary hypertension. So steroids, um, I mean, steroids are a must for these patients. Um, it's usually a um, 0.5 mix for kicks for 14 days, and then you do a long taper over three months. Of course, this is going to depend on their severity and how they respond to treatment. In terms of antifungals, um, there is some differing um, recommendations. Um, for some recommendations are, you know, have stated that if you're unable to taper steroids or if a patient develops an exacerbation on steroids, you should use antifungals. The um, Society of Infection Disease actually recommends that you use fungals from the start, antifungals from the start um, when you start treating ABPA. So you would start steroids, and uh, itraconazole um, is, usually, is the first line therapy. And the thought for this is that this will help reduce the 
amount of mucus impaction um, and pulmonary opacity seen on chest x-ray um, and uh, be able to help improve the uh, symptoms more quickly. Usually the, the IgE is monitored every one to two months. Um, resolution of opacities on imaging and the improvement in their symptoms are usually seen with a reduction in IgE. Um, remission is defined as almost, you know, basically back to normal um, IgE it may still be mildly elevated, absence of radiographic findings, or sorry, opacities, and the patient's on off steroids for six months. Um, if it's a refractory, you're unable to titrate off steroids. Um, omeluzumab was one thing that I had read that's been, that's been studied in the treatment of ABPA in those patients who you cannot titrate off steroids. Um, there was a randomized controlled trial that I, that I had read about that basically they had given uh, patients with chronic ABPA um, four months of omeluzumab versus placebo, and there was a statistically significant improvement, uh, or sorry, a reduction in exacerbations in those who received omeluzumab. Um, so that's one thing to note as well. Moving on to the next disease, so eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, formerly Turk strauss um, This is a rare disorder that causes vasculitis of small to medium-sized vessels. It can also be associated with extravascular eosinophilic granulomas. Um, there's a triad of chronic rhinosinusitis, asthma, and peripheral eosinophilia. Um, main, most commonly affects the lung and skin, but any organ can be affected, and the mean age is um, 50 years. There's three phases for the disease. The prodromal phase, uh, phase is, uh, con consists of asthma, allergic rhinitis, and sinusitis. Eosinophilic phase is basically a sharp rise in the eosinophils infiltrating multiple organ systems. And then the vasculitic phase, as the name suggests, is systemic vasculitis. And this is a very severe uh, stage. Patients don't necessarily have to proceed through these through this order, um, and they may present to you um, in, in any of any three of these orders. So just in, uh, uh, Phases, so it's just important to recognize what they are. So in terms of the organs affected, um, from a neurologic standpoint, you get peripheral neuropathy. Um, mononeuritis, multiplex is the most common. Um, pain and paresthesia can be seen in the vasculitic phase. Um, pulmonary, of course, like we talked about, is very common. Um, asthma in 90% of the patients, opacities with eosinophilia, peripheral effusions, and then rarely you can get alveolar hemorrhage. Um, in terms of uh, ENT findings, otitis media, allergic rhinitis, um, nasal and sinus symptoms, um, you can get subcutaneous nodules on the extensive surfaces. Skin biopsies um, often show leukoplastic vasculitis. In terms of cardiac, you can get cardiomyopathy, pericarditis, arrhythmias. Uh, renal, um, the kidneys are affected in 25% of patients. That's generally a poor prognostic factor. You need placenta, columnar nephritis, rapidly progressive as well. And then um, I didn't include it on this side, but there is some GI mass manifestations um, with gastroenteritis, uh, can cause abdominal pain, diarrhea, and bleeding. Pathogenesis is not completely understood yet, but they think it's a combination between genetic factors um, and acqui uh, acquired kind of determinants of infection or of the disease and then more in an immune level as well. So 40 to 60% of the patients are ANCA positive. Uh, genetic factors include an association with HLA alleles listed here. Um, immune, um, in terms of the immune pathways, it's thought to have an elevated Th1 and Th2 pathway, altered humoral uh, immunity, abnormal eosinophilic function as well. Now, medications that are associated with um, uh, with uh, this uh, disease are leukotriene modifying agents, omeluzumab, and inhaled steroids. Now, these aren't thought to have a direct, uh, you know, a direct effect, but they believe that it's basically unmasking the disease because these agents are often used to take people off steroids, and when you stop the steroids, that you can uh, um, you can then unmask the underlying disease. This is just a diagram showing what I just talked about. You've acquired determinants contributing genetic, and then of course the underlying um, immunology. Um, in terms of laboratory tests, there's no specific test. You kind of have to take it all collectively. You can get per peripheral eosinophilia, elevated IgE, elevated inflammatory markers, CRP and ESR. Um, ANCA, again, is positive in 40 to 60% of patients. And the presence of an ANCA um, 
Inca antibodies is associated with glomerulonephritis and vasculitis. In terms of pulmonary involvement, um, I have the chest radiograph on the left side. Um, this is a 51-year-old woman with a history of asthma and progressive dyspnea um, and was presenting with peripheral eosinophilia diagnosed with EGPA. So you can see here, this is bilateral um, consolidations and reticular opacity seen here. And then on the right side, I have a CT scan um, uh, cut. This was a 49-year-old asthmatic male or female with uh, quadroparesis, skin rash, and 49% eosinophils on her lap work. Uh, so this is showing subpleural ground glass opacities, uh, consolidations, central lobular nodules, and bronchial wall. So in terms of treatment, um, deciding prognosis and, and when to start treatment and what agents to start with, you use the five-factor score. Um, this was uh, this is basically um, a scoring system used on different um, presentations of the disease. So this, it was first developed in 1996 and was revised in 2011. Um, you're looking at age, cardiac disease, renal insufficiency, GI involvement, and absence of EMT manifestations, because the presence of that is a better prognosis. So steroids um, are the first, you know, first line of treatment for these patients. Um, depending on how, how they present, you may need higher disorder. Uh, with doses for severe cases, and there's a prolonged taper over you know a year to a year and a half usually. Um, cyclophosphamide is it is added to the steroids if your five factor score is greater than two, or if it's one within uh, with the cardiac or nervous system involved. Now there's a high chance of relapse in these patients if you stop these medications. So once remission is achieved, you usually switch to another agent for maintenance, most commonly azathioprine or methotrexate. Okay, drugs associated with eosinophilia. There's not a, there's not a lot of um, studies with the drug associated eosinophilia. Many of these are case reports from patients who are on these medications, um, and they found out, you know, of course, that these drugs have caused those symptoms. Um, the main there's ma uh, many different case reports on a whole uh, bunch of different medications, but the main categories are anticonvulsants, antimicrobials, cardiac medications, and NSAIDs. So in terms of anticonvulsants, Keppera, valproic acid, phenytoin, uh, antibiotics, daptomycin, nitrofurantoin, azithromycin, dapsone, sulfonamides, and cardiac medications, as many of us know, amiodarone, and of course, NSAIDs. There's, it's thought to be a hypersensitivity reaction to a drug or its components. Um, it can range from being very mild and asymptomatic to um, anywhere near dress sy uh, syndrome. Uh, imaging may show pulmonary opacities or pleural fusions, and it's often a diagnosis of, ex of exclusion. Treatment, of course, stop the medication. If they're, if they're presenting with more severe symptoms, you may consider a, a course of steroids. Um, for aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, um, there's a triad of asthma, eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis with polyposis, um, and aspirin or NSAID intolerance, of course, as the name suggests. You often see upper and lower respiratory tract symptoms, including bronchoconstriction, nasal congestion. Um, these patients usually have an adult onset asthma, and at the time of, um, time of uh, presentation, it's often very severe. Um, it's thought that there's a dysregulation of the arachidonic acid metabolism, and uh, which causes some abnormalities in the cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase pathways, and this leads to an accumulation of cysteine leukotrienes, which can cause inflammation um, at the level of the airways. Um, elevated eosinophils and mast, mast cells are also prevalent, which are, of course further um, worsens disease. So the diagnosis is clinical in most cases. You can do an aspirin challenge test where basically you can get, you monitor the patient after giving them medication and you see if there's any reaction. Um, but most of the cases is clinical. Um, it, an aspirin challenge test may be done if there's an indication that the patient needs to be on NSAID therapy and you need to make sure um, that they you know, actually have this disease. You treat them by avoiding the medication, optimizing their underlying asthma, which you can try leukotriene modifying agents. Um, and then uh, management of sinus disease, whether that's surgical or medical, and then aspirin desensitization if it's indicated. So if you have a patient who's got CAD and it needs to go on aspirin long-term, that would be a patient that you would need to do a desensitization with. And I know we see that in the NICU uh, fairly often. 
All right, so those are it for the disease processes. I did want to end with two questions. So the first question is a 68 year old man um, uh, developed progressive dyspnea and an unproductive cough for over a week. He underwent a total hip replacement six weeks ago, complicated by post operative wound infections, and was treated with IV vancomycin. His prosthesis was removed two weeks ago. Um, prior isolates included um, uh, MRSA, um, or sorry, yeah, MRSA, uh, Proteus, uh, E. coli. His current medications are sliding scale insulin, hydromorphone, um, PCA, uh, daptomycin, on which he was placed following the removal of his prosthesis. So now he's presenting you with hypoxia, um, statins 89% on six liters. This is his, the cut from the CT scan. So the question is, which of the following best characterizes the lung injury pneumonia associated with daptomycin? And you can just shout out the answer, talk about it among, amongst yourselves. So the answer is, C. So this is a drug-associated eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, the CT scan is showing ground glass opacities and reticular opacities. And there's also noted to be bilateral pleural effusions, which is seen in 70% of patients. Um, just as more information, the bronch in this patient uh, revealed a turbid BAL with 42% eosinophils. So daptomycin is the most common antibiotic-associated cause of acute eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, there's unclear mechanism of eosinophilic recruitment, but it's thought to interact with pulmonary surfactant, leading to an inflammatory cascade. Um, so, and with these patients, it's more so the duration of treatment rather than the dose-dependent uh, dose dependent treat treatment, and the mean onset is 2.8 weeks. And I know I didn't talk about acute eosinophilic pneumonia, but I just had a couple points here. So it's a rapid onset, progressive respiratory symptoms. These patients can get sick very fast and develop an ARDS-like picture. Symptoms include dyspnea, hypoxia, fever. You can see diffuse pulmonary infiltrates on imaging, um, increased eosinophils on DAL, which we saw in this, in this case. Um, most ca cases are idiopathic, but are associated with smoking, dust inhalation, and medications, and the treatment is steroids. All right, question number two. This is quite a long stem, so I'll let you guys read it and let me know if, uh, when I can change the slide. So this is the CT scan for this patient. The question is transition to maintenance therapy with which of the following single agents is most or most appropriate. What do you guys think? So the answer for this one is A, actually. So this patient, um, so in the, in the, let me go back to the slide, because maybe that will, that will help. Um, this was for, OK. So in patients with EVPA, uh, systemic steroids and cyclophosphamide can be used as induction therapy. right? So that patient was very severe, and they were already put on steroids and cyclophosphamide. Now, once remission is achieved, so we know that a renal function went back to baseline, and the respiratory symptoms have, um, have greatly improved, and the radiographic findings also have gotten better. These patients are high risk for relapse, right? So you want to put them on maintenance medication, and the answer here would be azathioprine. Um, azathioprine, methotrexate, rituximab are considered first-line therapies for maintenance therapy. Um, and you don't want to put patients on steroids long-term. Obviously, that has their um, 
has their own um, complications. And then Salsept has been shown to be inferior to azathioprine in some trials. Uh, Dr. Godfrey was my mentor for this uh, lecture, so I just wanted to thank her for all her help and guidance. And that is it.